Welcome to Daily Devotion with Ken Gurley. Devotions designed to inspire you on your daily walk with God. Here's your host, Ken Gurley. Hey, good Thursday morning to each of you post Valentine's Day. I hope you had a wonderful day yesterday. And um, we got some roses downstairs. They came a little late, but they're downstairs. And I, I hear Tessie downstairs, and I hear three grandchildren downstairs. So if you hear anything, I will not make as corny a joke as I did yesterday about the ducks that were outside of my room. I said they're not all they quacked up to be. I will not make that corny of a joke. My kids tell me that's dad humor, and that is out of bounds. Nobody thinks it's funny. I get, I get tickled by it. Steven, it's good to see you. Morris, good to see you. Catherine, happy that you're here. Daniel, Sherry, may the Lord bless you this day. And may you just find today to be the greatest day of your life. It's the only one we have, folks. This is the day the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. Some of you are encouraging me, saying it's funny. My kids would look at you, roll their eyes and say, don't encourage him. Okay, I'm just passing that along to you. And uh, I don't know what rolling eyes are in emoji language, but you guys can figure that one out. I am um, real happy today about uh, just today's subject. I, I woke up early this morning just thinking about the coming of the Lord. And uh, just thoughts, thoughts started flowing through my mind and my spirit and a lot of, a lot of walking down memory lane and reminiscing and growing up in this thing and messages that we heard. And um, Charlene, I, I will not mention the name of, because they are regular participants on the Daily Devotion family. They're out there. Now, if they want to confess who it is, who am I to say you can't confess? But I was at a children's camp when I was a kid wearing my T-shirt and my husky jeans and just sitting there with all the other hundreds of kids and not really paying attention, didn't get enough sleep the night before. And But this evangelist was up there preaching and and he had a, he had a guy sounding a trumpet. Or, hold it, let me back up. He said one... He said, you have fire drills in school. We're going to have a rapture drill this morning in, in children's camp, a rapture drill. And he'd have us jump up and down and like the rapture was taking place. And, and then he said, but one of these days, one of these days, there's, the trumpet's going to sound. And when your feet leave the ground, they're not coming back. And about that time, he had a guy stationed somewhere in a balcony or somewhere and he blew a trumpet. And that scared us as kids and woke us up, really. And uh, then we looked back up on the platform and he had a harness. We didn't know this. He had a harness attached to him and they started ratcheting him, him up. And he said, oh, this is it, kids. This is a rapture. I'm leaving. We are leaving the world behind. And then he looked out and said, but none of you are leaving. All of you have been left behind. I'm telling you what they did to us kids. Of course, the altars flooded and, and, um, we couldn't sleep at night. There was a lot of calls home. And and uh, yeah, that was our raising, folks. We were raised in the rapture-ready generation. One thing frightens me, yay, too. And, th and that person, by the way, is, that person that did that, that inflicted this cruelty on children, is a daily devotion member. And if they identify themselves... <laughs> You tell them what they what you think about it, all right? Uh, one thing, yay, too, frightens me. The first is that we forget things that matter, past lessons, past revelations, past teachings. But the second thing that almost scares me as much as the first is we try to live in the past. I don't know how to say it, but just go ahead and say it, all right? Uh, sentimentality and nostalgia can be deadly. They can arrest spiritual development. That people try to live in the past. Jesus said, no man, no man having drunk old wine immediately desires the new. Why? Because Jesus said, they will say, the old is better. And that's a dangerous philosophy when it comes to our walk with God. 
to say the old is better. I, and, I, and I believe in the old paths. I believe in the old landmarks and those old altars and the voice from behind saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. But I also know this. If each generation does not get it for themselves, then the church <clears throat> is one generation away from extinction. So even though, <clears throat> excuse me, I love our history. I lo love our heritage. And you'll hear me mention it time and time again. I will today. I know the danger of living in the past because it can foster a form of spiritual exclusivity, spiritual pride that can be deadly. That's why I, I sing the songs with the, new, with the next generation. I had my songs. I love my songs. Let them have their songs. So long as they lift up Jesus and have some good doctrine and teaching in them, let them have that fresh, up-to-date relationship with God. And I find myself these days, when I'm singing to myself, humming an old, an old song, I find that I'm, I'm singing the songs of the next generation, but nothing quite reaches me like the songs of my youth, my teen years. I, I sometimes think first generation people have a advantage. They, they come into the church with a messed up life, get a testimony. They don't have a secondhand experience. They can truly say, I once was blind, but now I'm seeing. But even knowing, even knowing that I'm, I'm averse to elevating the past, I'm, I'm about to go into the past. Can I just do that for a moment? Let's start with a reminder. Paul liked to remind people. Peter liked to remind people. And just a reminder. The many, many songs we once sung about the coming of the Lord. To that old Hawaiian classic, Aloha Oi, Jesus. Or here, here's this one. He's coming soon. He's coming soon with joy will welcome his returning. Or that one we sang that was a little peppier. Is that a word, peppier? I don't know. More peppy? Peppier? You grammarians help me out out there. It was peppier. Jesus is coming soon. Morning, night, or noon. What about this one? We'll be caught up to meet him in the air. This was a Old camp meeting classic, we're all going up, we're all going up, we're all going up in the first resurrection. Or what about I'll fly away? I, I grew up in a day where we sang a lot about the coming of the Lord. Or what about that, that one of my generation, could it be that this would be the day that starts eternity? All right, or that old Andre Kraut song, it won't be long, soon we'll be leaving here. I, I, love, I love these lines. Count the years as months, count the months as weeks, count the weeks as days, any day now, we'll be going home. Wow. Rapture, resurrection, eternity, those were common themes in my childhood and in my teens. There was a book that came out about 20, 25 years ago, Whatever Happened to Hell. Nobody talks about hell anymore, but it's still there. Few talk about the rapture, but it's still there. Pentecost came into its own in the 20th century. In fact, um, Pentecost dominated the 20th century. The people persecuted at the century's beginning were praised and imitated at its close. 600 million people alive at the end of the 20th century claimed to have be, been spirit-filled. One of the early catalysts, though, and I think we forget, we, we sort of think that doctrine is, okay, we believe in this, and we believe in this, and we believe in this, and it's sort of not all cohesive, that there's no cohesion with what we believe. But one of the early catalysts for the Pentecostal movement was an ardent, I'm going to use a big word, premillennialism. 
combined with a dispensationalist view. Early Pentecostals believed that the outpouring of the Spirit in 1901 signaled the closure of the church age and prepared the last day church for world evangelism. Yes. Now Jesus would then return, set up a literal 1,000 year rule of Christ on earth. All of it would fold into eternity. That belief that Jesus is coming soon was reflected in the Pentecostal mission, strategy, the music, lifestyle, theology. There are 30 plus New Testament passages that link our expectancy of the Lord's return with evangelism. Wow, he's coming soon. What we do, we must do quickly. With the way we treat one another, an evil servant says the master delays is coming. Wow. And our holiness. Paul said in Titus 2, the grace of God that has appeared bringing salvation to everybody teaches us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Why? Waiting for our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, our anticipation of his soon return is what prompts us, Randall, Melissa, it's what prompts us to live as we do. The soon return of Jesus, it was one of those, one of those ligaments, one of those tissues. You know, it was in Ezekiel's vision, the bones came together, then the flesh. The soon coming of Jesus was like the, the ligaments and the tissue that held the structure together. It's why the early church saw such great revival, is they believed they had such little time. The soon return of Jesus was a dominant force in our movement. Let me just say it like this, Linda, Miriam, you show me a church today, show me a group of people, show me a child of God, that lives in nearness and anticipation of his return. You may see Don and Diane come on here all the time. Could it be the day? Could this be the day? Yes, it could be. I get up every morning to do this daily devotion thinking this is my last devotion. Not necessarily because I'm going to perish and waste away and or something will happen to me that I can't speak. I do this because as the sun rises and I'm looking outdoors right now, looking at those clouds, I'm thinking, this may be it. This may be the day that Jesus returns. You show me a church, you show me a group of people, you show me a person that lives in the nearness of his return, and I can pretty much tell you that that church is reaching their world. That church is a praying church. That church preaches doctrine and teaches doctrine. That church treats one another right. That church not only talks the talk, they walk the walk. Because he's coming. He's coming very, very soon. In fact, I would tell you this. One could say that the entire church age, I mean, we think it's existed for 2,000 years, but you do remember a day is with the Lord as a 1,000 years. Just two days in the Lord's sight. The entire church age was born in the expectancy that we're living in the last of the last days because Simon Peter, on the very day the church was born, quoted Joel that in the last days, the Lord would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. You say, but it's been so long. But oh, oh, Brother Ashcraft, I know, I know it's been 2,000 years since he first came, but he's coming again. He that shall come will come. He's coming soon. Isn't that the close of the book of Revelation? Behold, I come quickly. I'm even at the door. He's coming soon. Oh, yes, he is. In fact, I would say that your church, if it's having revival, your church, if it's seeing conversions and people shaking free from habits, I can promise you that some of the connective tissue, the flesh, 
around the bones of your church is the anticipation that Jesus is coming soon. I had to give you all of that to explain this title, Has Jesus Already Come Back? I was reading, I was reading a verse of scripture in 2 Timothy. It's Paul's last letter. It's the last letter he's going to write, and then he's exiting this world. He wrote Hymenaeus and Philetus. Hymenaeus and Philetus. They're spreading something. It's, it's consuming people like gangrene, like a canker. That's King James Version. Hymenaeus and Philetus have erred concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened and they're overthrowing the faith of some. Let me just, let me just, let me just set the stage here. Nobody, nobody walks into false doctrine without being enticed of their own lusts. It's never just someone else's fault that I walk into false doctrine. There's some weakness on the inside of me. You'll find that um, Hymenaeus is also mentioned in context in another area of Paul's writings with Alexander the coppersmith who did him much harm. In other words, once you start moving into false doctrine, it's something inside of you that you are drawn away by your own lust. You show me a person that goes deep into false doctrine having known this truth, and I will show you a person that was not just deceived, but they had something on the inside of them. You remember what Jesus said about Satan? He has nothing in me. A person that goes into false doctrine has some foothold, some bridgehead, some area of their life that is not really given over to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're drawn away into that false doctrine because it feeds something on the inside of them. So when Hymenaeus and Philetus began to spread around, you know, the resurrection's already happened. Welcome to heaven. This is it. This is all we're going to see is what's down here. You may as well just forget about all that stuff, pie in the sky stuff. This is it. Resurrection's happened. Jesus has come back resurrection's not the future, it's in the past. And Paul said this doctrine, this teaching, this idea that Jesus had already come back was consuming people like gangrene. And since the resurrection is associated with Christ's return, they were basically saying, <clears throat> Jesus has already come back. Now, can I just tackle this subject right now? Because as strange as this sounds, there's a group of people out there that they believe we're in heaven right now. In fact, they mock the idea of that four square city, of the coming kingdom. They, there are people, there are people that actually say Jesus has already come back. But our Lord said that no man, no man knows the time of his return. His prophecies in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, they've not all been fulfilled. He stated clearly eight things have got to happen before he comes back. False Christ will appear and dece deceive many. Christ means anointed one. False anointed ones will come and deceive many. There will be wars and rumors of wars. Yes. World War II alone, over 30 million people died, including 6 million Jews. A fact that even today many people deny. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. This is the third sign. And, and you can see, you can look at the charts. Earthquakes are proliferating as never before, showing up in places they've never been known to be before. There will be worldwide persecution. The church would be hated of all nations for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we seeing that? where Christianity is the oldest in the Mideast, in the Mesopotamian Valley. Right now, Christianity is nearly extinct in some places because it's been driven out by other ideologies. Wow. Widespread betrayal, verse 10 of Matthew 24. Betrayal is the fruit of persecution. When people start being persecuted, you find out who's really got it in their heart. Can I just tell you this? I was always told that one of these days we're going to have to stand up. We're going to have to defend the name of Jesus. And if we stand for the name of Jesus, we're going to be burned at the stake. 
crucified, head chopped off, something like that. But could it be that our standing up for Jesus is a day-by-day thing, holding on to the truth? Because in the last day, there's going to be a betrayal. Then false prophets will deceive. Deception is going to be so common in the last day. Someone said of Christianity, I believe it was the former Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, that Christianity in America is 3,000 miles wide but a half inch deep. Yes, we've got nominal Christians, Christians in name only, that are so deceived. They couldn't tell you the plan of salvation. They basically believe that Jesus wants them to be happy and whatever they want is what Jesus wants in their lives. We're seeing that. We're seeing that. Deception. Widespread lawlessness and lovelessness. This is the seventh description. (sighs) Lovelessness, lawlessness. Oh, we're there. The God-ordained institutions are being turned upside down down within this decade. We are in the last of the last days. So no, Jesus hasn't already come back. And then finally, the gospel must be preached to all nations. This means that the gospel must be preached to the entire world before the second coming. Although there's disagreement amongst probably even those of us on this daily devotion right now about the exact timing of of the Lord's return. There's very little disagreement with us that Jesus is coming back. He has to come back. He's coming very, very soon. Recent research into the beliefs of early Pentecostals revealed their restorationist tendency. Parham, Seymour, Bartleman, and others believe that the outpouring of the Spirit a hundred years ago and the continued outpouring today is God's way to restore the church back to its pristine state, not primitive state, its pristine model state in the book of Acts. That the Lord is restoring the doctrine, the Lord is restoring the practices. Yes, and one thing those people believed, they believed that Jesus is coming soon. In fact, they believed. They believed in the early church that Jesus was coming back. Read 1 Thessalonians. You can find a group of people that were rapture ready that began to be overwhelmed by the idea that people were dying and Jesus had not yet come back. And Paul had to assure them that here's going to be the order of the resurrection. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be harpazo, caught up, raptured, to meet the Lord in the sky. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, Jesus has not already come back because that has not happened yet. I feel the presence of the Lord in this. Those early Pentecostals believed that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, they believed that was for the evangelism of the nations. Yes, they believed that all of the spiritual gifts that started coming on the church were to restore what they once had so that they could take the gospel to the whole world, that his name would be preached until the end of the age. So why am I saying this? Excuse me. Our message that Jesus is coming soon. Our message that what you must do to be prepared for his return is to obey the gospel. You die to your sins as he died on the cross through repentance. We are buried with him in baptism, rising, calling on the name of Jesus, and being filled with the life-saving power of the Holy Ghost. For if this same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, it will quicken your mortal bodies. Jesus has not already come back. He's still here. To the 745 of you, 
listening to me right now. Let me just say, Jesus' return is not in your rearview mirror. You need to lift your eyes to the eastern sky. Your redemption draws nigh. One thing you got to hand it to Satan. The Bible says, knowing his time is short, he grew more ambitious and more aggressive. We should know this. We're running out of time. We don't have time to get involved in worship wars and say, you should sing my songs and like my songs. We don't have time to say, you need to come back with me how it once was when I was a child. Don't have time for that. That, that is a waste of energy and effort and it's confusion. But what we do have time for is saying that old, old message that began 2000 years ago that I heard as a child is still just as good today. Jesus is coming soon. Could be morning, night, or noon. Could be at midnight, the cry sounded, go ye out to meet him. I know two will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two laying in the bed, one taken, the other left. Stop and think about that. Two in the field working during the day. Two in the bed, it's at night. This means it's going to be a global harvest. It's going to be daylight somewhere. It's going to be night somewhere. It's going to be a global rapture that lifts people off this planet. He's coming soon, folks. We're going to meet him in the clouds. We're going. We're going to be there. And it's going to be very, very soon. Has Jesus already come back? Hymenaeus and Philetus in 2 Timothy said, yes, he's already come back. But he's not already come back. He's coming soon. Don't fall for that lie. Don't fall for that deception. Don't live any way you please. You have this treasure in an earthen vessel. Pour it on somebody. Because he's coming. And he's coming very, very soon. Feel that with all of my heart. I want you to share this with somebody. I really do. I really do. There may be a prodigal out there somewhere. It may not be the thought of home that brings them back. It may be the thought that Jesus is coming soon. We saw that back during 1988. We saw prodigals come back home because they thought Jesus was coming back. May that awareness come back and grace them. Share this with others. Like, follow on Facebook, subscribe, YouTube. Wow, what a great day. Peggy, Deborah, this is our day. This Hardy, Linda, Kirk, this is our day. Thomas, our day. Rise up and declare he's coming. And he's coming very, very soon. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you again, maybe tomorrow. But it could be today that this is our last day to be here. Let's live that way. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Thank you for sharing a daily devotion with Ken Gurley. We pray this ministry has been a source of encouragement and strength to you. Please be mindful that your financial support enables us to meet with you each day. To give a donation or connect with us, visit our website at kengurley.com. There you will also find the latest books, podcasts, and resources. Blessed 90 Days to Change Your World is Pastor Gurley's latest book. You can get your copy of this life-changing book at kengurley.com. May God's favor rest on you in every way until we meet again.